We're recording. Okay. All right. Welcome to lecture two of structural analysis now that we've got all the technology and whatnot working. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, so first off, the attendance grades, they are posted to Blackboard. Uh, I went ahead and posted those. That seemed to work out pretty well, um, barring some you know minor issues and whatnot uh, with the QR codes. Oh, goodness, that's loud. Um, I went ahead and posted the recording from the last lecture to the uh, YouTube playlist. Uh, I'm using a little bit of a different microphone today. Hopefully, it works out a little better. Um, we're going to start using the class notebook today uh, in uh, uh, OneNote. And so if you go to the class channel, I changed the little icon to look like a bridge because you know I like bridges. But if you go here to class notebook, that'll open up OneNote. And if you navigate to content library, you'll be able to access uh, the notes from what we do today. The, the calcs and whatnot we're going to do today are pretty simple, um, but uh, uh, I wanted to show you that. All right. Um, Let's see. Uh, I also posted a message on Teams uh, illustrating the, uh, the the link to to the YouTube playlist. Probably worthwhile just to get on to make sure you can access that. But the YouTube playlist is also on Blackboard. We're going to assign our first homework today, and it's due Friday. Um, you'll kind of understand after today's lecture how straightforward it is because it's really really simple. Um, and and I, I want to get into basically the meat of that discussion. One. Uh, Final uh, comment before we move on. I did get a, a number of emails about the both the research and the TA position. Uh, give me a little bit to work out some details. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that on Friday. Um, but uh, I do appreciate all the uh, folks reaching out. That was that was really uh, great. Okay, maybe it'd help if I turn that on. Okay, all right. So um, let's talk about uh, uh, you know what we basically do here, uh, and this sort of ties into a discussion that we had uh, at the end of the the lecture on Monday, and and I, I mentioned a point that seemed like it was a hair splitting, but it's actually really important. We are not analyzing structures; we're analyzing these mathematical models that represent structures. Okay. And one of the biggest things that, that engineers need to understand uh, when they're designing structures is what models work for what situations and why. And that's going to be kind of something we explore throughout the entirety of the semester. Um, but the models that we use do utilize common tools, common member types, common boundary conditions. Um, and so what I want to uh, focus on today is understanding those modeling tools that we use uh, as well as being able to classify the systems. And so. Uh, what I mean by classification is I, I'm really looking at these two questions that I'm trying to answer, whether or not the system that we're analyzing is stable and whether or not it is statically determinate or indeterminate. Um, and you'll understand what that means uh, after today. Um, in order to do that, we have to understand you know, what type of system we're looking at, what are the boundary conditions, are there any internal releases, uh, et cetera. And so I'll show you some of the uh, tools that we use as well as some real life examples to kind of uh, get you into the uh, frame of mind of what we're talking about here. So let's talk about the modeling aspect first. Um, a lot of this is going to borrow off of uh, some stuff that you learned in statics and some stuff that you learned in mechanics of deformable bodies. So it should be familiar, but I just want to sort of set the uh, stage. At a minimum, it's probably been a while since you've looked at a lot of this, so the idea is to uh, bring it back to square one. Um, these tools that we're showing today are going to be tools that we use throughout the entirety of the semester. But it's, it's pretty uh, basic stuff. I think you uh, uh, will kind of get what I'm talking about here. Okay, so from the last lecture, this was uh, sort of where I ended the lecture last time. I showed you a real world system. This is a roof truss on a typical residential or commercial facility. Uh, and what we're doing in here is taking this real world system and idealizing it as a mathematical model with a series of loads, members, boundary conditions, uh, etc. Um, what we want to do is utilize these models to represent this real world behavior because these models are what allow us to analyze the system, determine their forces, and, and ultimately design. And again, what we're doing is we are by, by employing these models, we are introducing some assumptions and we are simplifying the problem a little bit. It's something you got to keep in mind. We're designing three-dimensional complex systems and we're turning them into these mostly, in our world, two-dimensional uh, analytical models. So there is some assumption and some simplification going on. 
but there are reasons for that. And we'll talk about some of this stuff as the semester progresses. So for instance, here's a typical real world trust system. Here's an analytical model. And there are reasons for the way it's laid out. There are reasons why all of the loads are applied only at the joints and not on the members. There are reasons for that. And we'll talk about that as the uh, semester goes on. But again, the goal is to represent the behavior uh, as close as possible. So one of the things that we do in civil engineering land quite a bit is we take 3D and we turn it into 2D. Um, we do that a lot. Um, 2D is much more uh, easy to handle. Uh, it is, uh, we can be much more sure of the results of that 2D model. Even if there is a little bit of conservatism uh, built in the analysis, it is typically the way that we go, unless it's otherwise unavoidable. So for instance, I'll give you sort of a close to home example. If we're talking about this building, I can tell you that the vast majority of the structure in this building was designed using two-dimensional representation. The beams supporting the floors, the columns supporting the gravity loads in the building were all designed using 2D or, or 1D idealization. The only components in the building that might have been designed using uh, three-dimensional modeling, and I say might because while this building is you know, not just a rectangular box. It's not that complicated. It's not some, you know, Burj Khalifa or some, you know, 50, 100 story building. I mean, this is a, a pretty straightforward building from a structural engineering standpoint. Most of the building was designed using, um, using uh, 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 2D models. I'll tell you a little bit, uh, I'm go going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I'll tell you a little bit of a factoid about buildings uh, so, so that you're aware. Uh, last time, we talked about the loads that, uh, that buildings experience, and <clears throat> we sort of broke them into two categories. We said uh, there's gravity loads, you know, like dead load, live load, snow load, and then we said there's lateral loads, like wind and seismic, okay? And so let me sort of set the stage so that you, you understand. Um, I'll give you an example on the side. You're in a car with your friend, they're driving. They don't know what they're doing, they're a horrible driver. They're driving 55 miles per hour, and then they suddenly hit the brakes. What's the first thing you slam into? Thank you. He said the dashboard. You slam into the seat belt. <laughs> First time I asked that question, I got dashboard, I got windshield, I got the pavement, I got... <laughs> Dr. Bryce would have been horrified. Um, <laughs> no, but, but here, here's my point. Um, when you design a vehicle, you do not design the entire vehicle to restrain you in the event of a collision. You install a system that is meant to do that, and we call that system the seatbelt. In buildings, we don't design the entire building to withstand lateral loads we install a particular frame in the building to withstand wind and seismic. The whole building isn't designed for that, just a small component of it. That small component in a building like this, because it does have some irregular geometry, it's really long, it has a really long aspect ratio. Um, we might, uh, the structural engineer might have used some 3D techniques for that, but most of it would have been taking a three-dimensional structure like this and idealizing it into a two-dimensional model. We do that quite a bit. We have some tools uh, to do that some means of distributing loads using tributary area. We'll talk about that near the, uh, near the end of the semester, but this is really how it's done in most structural analysis problems in the real world. So a lot of what we do in here is gonna focus on two-dimensional problems uh, like you see here. So that's gonna lead into how we classify some of our structures here in a bit. Now, let's talk about boundary conditions, okay? When I uh, talk about boundary conditions, what I'm talking about is the uh, components of the model that attach the structure to what I'm calling the ground. The ground could be either the actual ground or it could be the next adjacent element. So for instance, anybody recognize this picture, right? I would think you would, that's the canopy outside here, right? So for instance, if I'm looking at, let's say this, um, let's say this, this roof beam right here, the boundary conditions are going to be the supports that attach it to the next adjacent ground beam. So I'm going to look at that beam and I'm going to say the supports are on either end. And whatever the reactions are here, those reactions are loads on this beam. Whatever those reactions are goes to the column, sort of like a hip bone connected to the leg bone thing, and the load goes all the way to the ground. Um, but the other thing that's uh, really important is identifying the particular type of boundary condition uh, that you're going to use when you're analyzing the structure. 
So for instance, if I'm looking at the, uh, the, um, the beam to beam connections or the beam to column connections, if you're ever out there, go check it out. What you'll see is that the way the beams are connected, so you have your I-beam, right? So anybody know what we call the top and bottom plates? If you have an I-beam, anybody remember what you call those? Those are the flanges, there you go, and the middle is the web, yeah. So if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, beams in that, uh, in that canopy, you'll find that all the beams are connected only via the web. You won't find any bolts between the flanges of the beams, and there are reasons for that. Those are designed as simple connections. Simple connections meaning they only transmit shear. If we connected the flanges, they would uh, transmit moment uh, as well. So I would use just like a hinge roller boundary condition for those beams. Whereas if I was looking at, let's say, this column, this column is at the bottom, it's encased in the concrete. And dependent upon how deep it is, I might consider that as a fixed boundary condition so that it's transmitting not just shear and moment as well. Now, let's be clear, there's not going to be a lot of you know, lateral load on this column. I mean, it's not seeing that much load you know, in comparison to, say, a 30-story building or anything, but we might consider those base columns in a 30-story building as fixed connections dependent upon uh, how those are detailed. So understanding those boundary conditions are, are, are fairly important. Here's the three main boundary conditions that we utilize uh, in civil engineering uh, analysis. So the first off is a pin support. You might hear me call this a hinge support as well. That's the same thing. So pin supports, uh, if you ever see me draw them on the board, uh, or uh, the board, I, the, I mean the, you know, here on the screen, uh, I'll draw those with sort of a, a triangle symbol. Um, uh, Any time that you have a, a, a pin support or a hinge support, uh, they can develop two unknown reactions. Uh, and we split those up into X and Y components usually. So whenever we're analyzing a structure that has a hinge support, let's say this is support you know, B, I might have there's a reaction BX and a reaction BY. Um, this is the symbol that your book uses. Kind of looks like a, a, a triangle, but um, that's, that's what I'll use here. And I've got some, uh, some uh, real world examples. Again, you know, I would idealize a connection like this uh, utilizing a, a, a simple support, a hinge support, because the flanges aren't connected. The webs are, but the, uh, the flanges aren't. Typically, when you're looking at I-beams, the, uh, the flanges are what we assume transmit the moment, and then the web is what we assume transfers the shear. So just that vertical force reaction, all we need uh, is to connect the web. Now, again, uh, no moment uh, is developed uh, with a pin support. With a roller support, uh, a roller support is, uh, so it's, it's sort of the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's akin to a, a hinge support, but basically the difference is that we allow lateral translation in a, uh, in a, uh, a roller support. There are real world examples of this to this day. Uh, it's kind of difficult to photograph because of the conditions, but I'll tell you one that we use today in bridges is we used uh, what are called fixed and expansion bearings. How many of you did any sort of summer work with the DOH or anything like that? Okay. Did anybody go on any bridge inspections? Okay. Did you have to look at the bearings? So have you heard the term fixed bearing and expansion bearing? Okay. So if you know the difference between a fixed bearing and an expansion bearing, the expansion bearing, the plates have slotted holes, right? The reason why is, okay, anybody driving around yesterday around 4 or 5 o'clock is about 100 degrees outside, right? It was a pretty hot day yesterday, okay? Well, imagine what it's going to be, or imagine what it was six months ago during the ice storm to end all ice storms. That's a, a hell of a temperature shift, right? Well, just think thermal expansion and contraction, right? Uh, just the bridge beam itself is going to get longer and shorter throughout the year due to the uh, variable temperatures, right? So what we want is one of those supports to allow a little bit of lateral translation, right? So there are real world reasons why we would actually allow a structure to translate on one end and not the other. So the fixed bearing will have just you know, circular holes and then the expansion bearing will have those slotted holes to allow it to move a little bit. It's also one of the reasons why bearings on bridges, modern uh, bearings, are not, I mean, this is kind of an older way of doing it. Modern bearings, anybody tell me what a modern bearing looks like? Anybody know? 
Yeah, they're, they're like a, they're a, a vulcanized rubber pad. They put steel plates inside it to act as reinforcement, but it basically looks like a black rubber pad, like a black slab of jello. And as, it, as the uh, temperature changes and as load is applied, it can move a little bit. So you kind of want that uh, in the real world. But what we would do as analysts is we would I idealize that as either a hinge or a, uh, a pinned or a roller connection. And so whenever I draw a roller, I'm just going to draw um, like a circle, sort of thinking of it like a wheel. Um, keep in mind rollers, uh, they can analytically, are according to the rules that we're going to develop, they can uh, develop reactions both up and down. The idea is that they can, they can just translate uh, left to right. Sometimes your book might draw it like that, where it looks like a little skateboard, you know, <laughs> little roller skates, but that's sort of the idea. Okay, fixed supports um, are ones that transmit both shear and moment. So they develop all three. So anytime that you see a fixed support in a problem, you're going to have uh, both X reactions, Y reactions, and a concentrated moment reaction at that, uh, at that support. Uh, and you can always characterize a fixed connection in the real world um, whenever you, like for example, it might be a little hard to see here, but you can see this beam framing into this wall, and there's that end plate, and the connection is going either, it's either directly connecting the flange or it's going beyond the flange. If you're ever looking at reinforced concrete structures, you'll see that the beam and the column have been cast as one whenever you're looking at, at fixed connections. That's a very common way of doing it. If you go to the, uh, the Third Avenue garage, what you'll see is there are some places where they literally just sat the beams on these little corbels. So uh, if you're ever in the Third Avenue garage, take a look at this. Let me see if my pen will allow me to do this. But you'll see, like here's the column, and you'll see this little like nub stick out of the column, something like that. And then you'll see a beam sitting on it like that, and then here's the floor that they, or the, the slab that they cast on top of it, and then the car sit on top of that. Take a look at the columns and see if you see these little, uh, little nubs sticking out. As analysts, we would look at that beam and say that's just a simple connection. Whenever we're dealing with fixed supports and you look at it in reinforced concrete land, you'll see the beam and the column. They're actually cast together, so it'll actually, it'll actually look you know, like that, all as one cast. Does that make sense? So yes, that's what, um, that's what a fixed support looked like. And in the textbook, I mean, this is kind of what it looks like. They're just a flat line and sort of a, a little hatch. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, um, sometimes uh, what we do uh, in, in civil engineering structures, structures but, uh, is we install what's called an internal release. Um, the, by and large, the most common internal release that we will be dealing with in this course and as structural engineers period is an internal hinge. Um, now keep in mind again there is a difference between actually putting a real a hinge in a structure and detailing a connection so that it, it behaves according to those principles. So for instance if I had two beams that were spliced together and I only connected the webs but not the flanges I would treat that as an analyst as an internal hinge because since the flanges aren't connected that connection really can't resist any appreciable moment. Now there are some more direct corollaries to internal hinges that are in existence in real life. If you ever see a connection like this, this is what's called a pin and hanger connection. Uh, you see this in some older uh, steel bridges, even some that are uh, in service in West Virginia. Those act a whole lot more like uh, internal hinges. And the idea uh, about an internal hinge from an analyst standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint, is it's a point where we know the internal conditions of the structure. And whenever we have internal hinges, we know that at that point, the sum of internal moments is zero. So it helps us uh, perform structural analysis because it's a known quantity uh, about the, the structure. So far so good, any questions? All right, that's pretty much all the background that you need in order to begin classifying structures. So let's talk about structural classification. And what I'm really interested in, in determining are two things. I wanna determine whether or not the structure is stable and I want to determine its static determinacy, okay? And so I'm sure you're like, what is that? That sounds real complicated. Trust me, it's not. It's really simple. Okay, let's go back to statics land. I know you all uh, 
are, are, are uh, just you know jumping at the gun to go back to statics, right? Don't worry, uh, we aren't going to be doing any IJK in here, no cross products or anything. We're not doing that, but we are going to be using principles of statics to, to analyze structures. What the way that that I uh, uh, like to frame it is, we're taking statics and making the math and the process easier. But we are analyzing some more complicated systems. So that's sort of the, the trade-off in here. Now let's go back to basics of static. So any rigid body has to adhere to two fundamental principles. The sum of forces uh, must be zero, and the sum of moments must be zero in order for that system to be in static equilibrium, right? Well, if we're looking at 3D, in 3D that would be six equations, six unknowns, because there's three force equations, right? Some of forces in the x direction, some of forces in the y direction, some of forces in the z direction, and the same thing with moments. Some of moments about the x axis, some of moments about the y axis, some of moments about the z axis. Um, but if you remember, I said, hold on, we're going to take three dimensional systems and idealize them as two dimensional models. So what I can do is take this group of six equations and turn it into three because I'm only looking at 2D. So whenever we solve for reactions, solve for internal forces, et cetera, we're going to be looking at basically these three expressions, the sum of forces in the x direction, the sum of forces in the y direction, and the sum of moments. If you want your formula sheet for the first exam, that's kind of it right there. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of joking a little bit, but not really. You, you, I'll, I'll let you use a formula sheet. We'll get to that de uh, detail later. Um, but yeah, this is where a lot of what we're doing, uh, a lot of what we're doing in here, this is what it's based off of. So let me sort of lay it, lay it out on the line. Let me give you an example. So here's the problem. This should be uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, shaking the rust off of those uh, statics problems that you did a year ago, uh, either with me or uh, with another professor. But um, let's take a look at this problem. So I have a beam. Uh, it's a 40-foot long beam. And it's got a series of point loads on it. It has a 20 kip load, a 15 kip load, 16 kip load. Everybody knows what I mean by a kip, right? One kip is 1,000 pounds. Very common unit uh, in civil engineering. We're going to be using it quite a lot in here. Which, by the way, uh, unless it's uh, highly avoidable, we probably won't be dealing with SI in here. We'll be primarily US units because this is civil engineering. We build civil engineering structures. When Lowe's start stocking all of their lumber and yardsticks and all that in metric, we'll start using metric. So, I mean, it's just the facts of the world. Um, okay, here's the structure. Let's say I want to determine the reactions. Okay, so let's go back to what we just talked about. Pinned or hinge support, I have an unknown reaction in the x direction. I have an unknown reaction in the y direction. Two unknowns here. Okay, I have my roller reaction over here. I have one unknown. Okay, so how many, before I start doing any math, how many unknown quantities do I have for this problem in terms of their reactions? I have three, right? I have AX, AY, and BY. Now, let, let's be clear. Um, what is AX? Can anybody look at that and tell me what AX is? It's zero, it's zero right? Now, how did you do that, though? Let, let's, let's think about that. How did you do that? You looked at the structure and you said, are there any loads going to the left and right? No, right? So you said, if the sum of forces in the x direction equals zero, and there's nothing going in the x direction, then that has to be zero, right? So here's what you did. You have three unknown quantities, and in order to determine one of those unknowns, you used one of your knowns, right? You used this fact to determine that quantity, right? So if I've got two unknowns, and I've got two equations of equilibrium, would it be fair to say that for this problem, I could solve for all of the unknowns using just the equations of statics? I have sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, I have sum of moments. Three unknown quantities, and I have three equations, right? There is a particular name for this type of problem. Uh, and, and to be clear, let, let me also be clear, we can also do that internally. Like, if I'm looking at the internal forces inside a member, I have at most in two dimensions an unknown axial force, unknown shear, unknown moment, three unknown forces, three known equations of equilibrium. I can do the same thing at, uh, internally. So whether I'm looking at external support reactions 
or I'm looking at internal forces, it's the same story. I can do the same thing. Uh, the point is, I have three equations of equilibrium, and for the problems I've been looking at, I have three unknowns. Whenever the number of unknowns match the number of knowns, we have a name for that. We call it statically determinant. Okay? That's what a system that is statically determinant means. It means that we can use only the equations of statics to solve for all of the unknowns in the system. Okay? If there are more unknowns than there are equations of uh, equilibrium, then that system is statically indeterminate. And do we deal with statically indeterminate systems in the real world? You betcha. If I have, let's see, here's an abutment, here's the ground, here's an abutment, here's the river, there's the little water symbol to make Dr. Waite happy. I have a pier. And then I put my bridge on top of it. How many times have you ever seen that in the state of West Virginia? A few times, right? So that analytically, that beam would have four reactions, right? If I'm looking at this beam right here and that beam right there, four reactions. Only three equations of equilibrium. That is a statically indeterminate structure. Don't worry, we'll talk about statically indeterminate structures later. Most of what we do in here will be statically determinate systems. But, um, but the idea is that the first thing that we need to do, that's why the focus of this lecture is classification, is we need to be able to look at a system and go, what the heck's going on? Is it determinate? Is it indeterminate? Etc. Now, if it's the other way around, if I have a system that has more equations than we do unknowns, then it's actually unstable, okay? And uh, I'll show you some examples here in a bit of, of how that actually works out. Now, um, if there's any one equation that you need to write down today, it would be this one. This is an equation for the degree of external indeterminacy, okay? Now, if you're wondering why it's external indeterminacy, it's because right now we're looking at the external support reactions. Later on, we will develop expressions for internal indeterminacy. And we'll have different expressions for the internal indeterminacy of trusses and the internal indeterminacy of frames and et cetera. So for right now, we're just looking at the external support reactions. So this is going to apply to really any, uh, any external system uh, that we're looking at. Uh, in order to determine the, um, the degree of external indeterminacy, which I'm calling this term I, what we're basically doing is we're comparing the number of unknowns to the number of knowns. So we're taking our unknowns, which is this term R, so that term right there is the unknowns, And this term right here is the knowns. Okay? So, what's going on with the unknowns and the knowns? The unknowns are my support reactions. However many support reactions I have for the problem. The number of knowns I have is EC plus 3. Well, what's going on there? Well, why do I have 3? Let's start there. Why 3? Like, why isn't it 27 or 2.6? Why is it 3? So there's three equations of equilibrium for statics. Exactly right. Um, but what else would I know? Well, it's this term, equations of condition. All that is is a hyper-fancy term for the number of internal releases in the system, the number of, let's say, hinges. Okay. If a system had two internal hinges, then EC would be two. Because inside the structure, at that hinge, I know that the sum of moments are zero. So it is a known quantity. That's what analytically a hinge is doing for you. Is it's telling you, I know the internal uh, moment at that point is zero. Now, if this term is negative, that means you have more knowns than you do unknowns, and the structure is unstable. And we'll talk about why that works here in a second. If the... Um, if the section is, uh, if, the, if the value is positive or if it's zero, I have here a note that the structure 
should be statically determinate or it should be statically indeterminate because, and this is actually kind of important here, a non-negative value of i or of i sub e does not guarantee that a structure is stable. And for a structure to be stable, there's a couple of conditions that have to be satisfied. And I think you'll understand um, why that is when you start looking uh, at some of these examples here in a bit. So let's look at um, some ex basic examples. So I have here a structure. This is a beam and it has two roller supports. So what do I have? I have R equals 2 and I have E sub C equals 0. So if I use my expression here, 2 minus 3, I get negative 1. So I get here that this structure is unstable. So the math tells me this structure is unstable. But let's just take the math off to the side and look at the structure. Can anybody tell me why this structure is unstable? It's a skateboard, basically, right? If I take a load and apply it laterally, there is no way the system can resist that, right? It's going to translate. We're talking about structures that must satisfy static stability. They have to sit still, right? So that structure is not going to sit still under lateral load. It's going to move, right? That is an unstable structure. Here, we have a structure that is stable because we have three reactions. We have three unknowns. We get an I value of zero. I will go ahead and tell you that this structure is stable. And I'll tell you why. I mean, I is zero. I is not negative. But there are other reasons why this system uh, uh, is stable. And if we go to this one, this one has way more unknowns than we do equations of equilibrium. It has, uh, well, way more. It has two more. We have five unknown support reactions because this is a fixed support. So it's got one, two, and three. Then we have two rollers. So the number of reactions is five. We have three equations of equilibrium, no internal releases. So we get an I value of two. And so the way that we would classify this structure is we would get a stable and statically indeterminate structure. And we say it's indeterminate to the second degree because I is two. So it has too, too many unknowns. Does that make sense? So, uh, so yeah. One thing that, is, that I want to keep, I want to make sure that this is very important. If a structure is unstable, it's unstable. I don't care what the I value is or whether it's indeterminate to the 22nd degree. If it's unstable, it's unstable. It, none of the other stuff matters. I mean, if a structure, if we build a structure and it's unstable and it falls down and kills somebody, is anybody going to care what the I value is? All right, so that doesn't matter. Okay. Now, I told you that a non-negative value doesn't guarantee that the structure is stable because for a structure to be stable, three things have to happen. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to have a non-negative value of I. So anytime I is negative, it's unstable. That's just right there. But the reactions also cannot be concurrent and they can't be parallel. Let's take a look at this example right here. Okay. If you were to compute the I value for this structure right here, you would get four reactions, zero releases, so you'd get an I value of one. Well, it's stable and statically indeterminate to the first degree, right? Wrong. Because those reactions are parallel. They're all parallel, so it's a skateboard, right? It's the same story as before. I could throw a hundred rollers on there. It doesn't matter what I comes out to be, it's unstable. Does that make sense? So you don't classify that as unstable and indeterminate to the first degree. No, it's just unstable. Just unstable. All right? What about this one? With this structure here, the reactions are all concurrent, okay? And what I mean by that is they all come to a common point. They all meet right here. I posit to you that this structure is also unstable. Can anybody tell me why? This structure up top cannot resist translation. This structure can't resist rotation. This is a wheel. I can take this and turn it and the structure can't resist it. 
So it is unstable from a rotational standpoint. Okay? Even though I is 1. Make sense? So the three possible classifications that you can have for a structure are either unstable, stable and statically determinate, or stable and statically indeterminate to nth degree, whatever the, the value is. Does that make sense? So, just to clarify, what do hinges do? Hinges just reduce that, uh, that classification. So, let's go back. Let, here, let me go back here. So, remember how I said that this structure is stable and statically determinate? And I said, don't worry, I'll explain to you why it's stable. The reason it's stable is because these three reactions are neither all parallel or all concurrent. These two are concurrent, but not this one. You see what I mean? It doesn't meet at a common point. That's what gives it its stability. Like these two are parallel, but that one isn't. Make sense? Okay. So just to be clear, what do internal hinges do? Internal hinges give you E sub C values, right? So this structure has five reactions and zero hinges, so it's indeterminate to the second degree. But this structure has an internal hinge. So what's going on with this structure is there are five unknowns, but there are four known quantities. I know that the sum of forces in the x direction is zero, the y direction is zero, the sum of moments for the entire structure is zero, and then I also know that the sum of internal moments at that hinge is zero. I'm going to show you how to compute reactions for structures with internal hinges later. And basically it involves breaking out the uh, secret weapon of structural engineering, which is of course a samurai sword, or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, because what we're going to be doing is cutting sections. And we're going to be cutting sections through that hinges, through that hinge, and using equations of equilibrium to determine the internal reactions uh, uh, due to that condition. Let me stop for a sec, because don't worry, we're going to have some more uh, uh, in-depth examples here in a bit. Any questions? Okay. All right. Let's let's break out the uh, the actual notebook and do some stuff together. Okay. So I've got a series of examples here that we're going to do together. I've got like four of them because uh, I'm all about doing examples together. Let's see. I do not want to keep my ink annotations. So um, just so that everybody's clear, um, and I'll pull this up on uh, one note here in a second, but when you go to your uh, teams and you go to the team for structural analysis, what you should do, what you should be able to do is up top, go to class notebook, and it should actually pull up OneNote, but you can open OneNote up on your browser. You can probably even pull OneNote up on your phone if you have the app. Um, but what you can do is, uh, like, I'm going to open it up in the desktop app. And then go to structural analysis, and you'll look for this thing here on the... Uh, uh, oh, I hovered my mouse over. You're going to look for this thing here on the left called Content Library. And uh, inside Content Library uh, is all of the, the calculations that we're going to do together. So uh, let's see. So if you look, you should see these problems. In fact, I wrote this on Monday. If you look on your OneNote right now, that should still be there. Um, but what I'm, I'm going to do now is erase it, and I'm going to do all of these problems together. And you ought, you ought to check the OneNote on your, on your own time, and you should see that those problems, uh, that all these calculations are there. So let's do the first one together, and then I will get you all to help me out with some of the other ones. So let me erase this. Okay, so let's look at this first problem. Okay, so I have here, so we're going to go from left to right. Okay, so I look at the structure. I have a pin support. I have a roller and a roller. So the rollers each have one reaction. The hinges have two, or the pin supports have two. So I put one, two, three, four, right? And remember, this is the expression we're using. I is R minus... EC plus 3. Right? So for this problem, 
we have an R of 4, right? There are four reactions. I don't see any internal hinges. Like on example 2, we have internal hinges, so, but not on example 1. So EC is 0. Therefore, I is 4 minus 0 plus 3. 4 minus 3 is 1. And is the structure stable? Yes, it is. So this structure would be stable and statically indeterminate. To the first degree. What do you think? Not, this isn't hard, right? We're starting simple, right? We're starting basic. Okay? All right. What about the next one? Now I'm going to get your help. How many reactions for this support here on the left? Three, Three right? Because there's X and Y and a moment. How about this one? Three, right? So, X, Y, moment. X, Y, moment. And it doesn't matter what direction that you draw them in. It also doesn't matter from a, just a math standpoint. What you do is assume a direction, and if you get a positive answer, it means that direction was assumed correct. If you get a negative answer, it doesn't mean you need to develop significant emotional distress. It just means that you assume the wrong direction, so it's okay. All right? So, in this case, R is 6. What about E sub C? What is E sub C for this second problem? 3, three right? Because there's 3 hinges. IE is 6 minus 3 plus 3, which is 0. And the reactions are not all concurrent or parallel. Which, by the way, can you read this? If, it, if I need to write bigger or smaller, let me know, okay? I mean, it will hurt my feelings because you're making fun of my handwriting, but I can take it, you know. It's a joke. My goodness. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you are wearing masks, so. You are wearing masks. That's a good point. Okay. Example three. What's going on with example three? You're shaking your head. Why? Skateboard. It's a skateboard. It's unstable, right? Now, what I can do, in order to sort of like make the point, what I can do is draw my reactions and say parallel reactions and say unstable. And so to be clear, whenever you have an unstable structure, it, it doesn't matter what I is or what degree, it's unstable. Just period. Just unstable. Any questions? All right. Now this one. I want you all to do this one. Tell me what the answer is. I'm going to give you a sec. And whoever gets the answer first, you can just shout it out. Or raise your hand or whatever. Does anybody have the answer for it? That's right. It's sta you said one. That's right. It's stable and statically indeterminate to the first degree. Here's why. So we look at our reactions. How many reactions per support? Three. Three. 
So R is 6, E sub C is 2, okay? So therefore, and if you ever see me draw the three dots, that's just the symbol for therefore. I'm not sure. I didn't want to gloss over that. Equals 6 minus 2 plus 3, which is 1. I don't like that. I'll just do regular one. And um, the reactions are not all concurrent or not all parallel, so it is stable and statically indeterminate to the first degree. We think this is simple, right? Okay. Any questions? All right. So a couple things moving forward. Um, you have your first homework assignment today. Uh, it opens at 11 a.m. Uh, on this. I gave you five structures out of the textbook. All you got to do is classify them, write it up, scan it, submit it on on Blackboard. That's it. It's your first homework assignment. Not hard, right? Now. Moving forward, I'll tell you a little bit about how I do class. Uh, I, try, I try to do it virtually, but uh, you know, uh, it's always a challenge with that, but we're going to do this in person. This is sort of how class works for most of the problems where we start out, and some of the problems that we do in here are kind of long, you know, some of the trust deflection problems or so on and so forth. So bring a calculator. And what I might do is I might be working the problem and I say, okay, what's the answer? And I might say, okay, did you get 26.4? Okay, is that value second? Did somebody else tell me they got the same thing? So bring your calculator. We're going to be doing a lot of problems together, you know, a lot of analysis problems. These were quick. These are simple. Some of them will, will get a little longer. The shear and moment diagram problems, the trust deflections, influence lines, all that. It probably is not the worst idea in the world to bring a... Um, uh, uh, bring a, a straight edge, because, uh, at least not right now, but when we start doing trusses and shear, shear moments, it's actually pretty useful because you need some neatness for it to work right. Sound good? That's all I got, everybody. We'll see you on Friday.